If you're considering a career in medicine, this show is for you. I'm going to be talking to a variety of healthcare professionals who are going to share the reality of what it takes to have a successful career in medicine. The good, the bad, the inspiring, the funny. My name is Michelle Nesky. I'm a physician assistant and your host about to bring you Beyond the Scope. If you've done research into applying to physician assistant school, you know how crazy it is with all the different requirements, programs out there, and how do you choose which one is best for you? Well, luckily, two of my friends and PAs created an amazing platform that you can do this all in one place called My PA Box. Research schools by state, track your hours, look up all the requirements literally in one spot at mypabox.com. You can also use their PA school match to enter in all your demographic information, your GPA, whether or not you took the GRE or PA CAT, and filter for schools that would be the best fit for you. You guys, this has been game changing for pre-PAs and I use it all the time with my clients. You can go ahead and get a one-year subscription. And because you're listening to this podcast, if you use Posh PA 15, you can get 15% off your one-year subscription. You will not regret this. If you are a pre-PA, it will sort things out so much for you and just make it easier to do the research on the programs that are the best fit for you. So check them out, mypabox.com. So you guys, I am so excited. I have Katie Martin here, who's a PA in dermatology, who has opened her own practice. So I cannot wait um, to talk to her and get all the information about this. And she lives in California. So just be, you know, aware that this is, you know, California based. Um, And so, but first, I just want to ask Katie a little bit about herself and how she decided to be a PA. So Katie, Thank you so much for being here and, and tell us a little bit how you decided to be a PA. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, Michelle, I just want to say thank you for having me. I love your podcast. I love all of everything you do on Instagram. It's just awesome. Thank for, you. Just the physician assistant community and the medical community as a whole. So just want to thank, thank you Thank you, for you so much. Um, so I guess my story begins in Pennsylvania. <laughs> I was at Penn State and I was pre-med as many might be. Um, I got to my junior year in college, I took the MCAT, I was ready to start applying and I had this epiphany just one day and I thought to myself, I don't want to do this. I don't think I can do another four years of school, residency, the unknown, Mm -hmm. all of that. So I went to my guidance counselor who was really close to at the time and um, I asked her, I said, what should I do? I was in tears. And she's like, have yeah. you ever thought of physician assistant school? And I said, uh, no. And that's where it all started. That's so crazy. that was yeah. junior year. And as you know, Michelle, sometimes PA schools require a lot more prerequisites yeah. than medical schools. So yeah. I was scrambling to get more of the prerequisites done like genetics and the other things that weren't really required for medical school right yeah Um, but still ended up graduating in three and a half years at Penn State so wow that's amazing and so when you were like so a lot of people I have a lot of clients that thought they wanted to be a doctor like wanted to be pre-med and had a similar experience um and many PA schools follow a very similar trajectory to um med schools but some don't and a lot actually required these extra classes that you were not expecting, like medical terminology and genetics and like, you know, other things. So I think it's important to know. (laughs) It's absolutely true. And then on top of that, then studying for the GRE, which I never thought I would do. Oh my God. So finishing the MCAT and then doing that. But I actually took a year off between uh, Penn, leaving, graduating Penn State and actually get going to PA school. Okay. Or I guess on a year and a half. So I I worked as a patient care tech at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, where nice. I lived for that year and a half just to get patient hours. And I thought forever that I was going to do pediatrics. Now, are you from Pennsylvania or are you from California? Great question. So I grew up in California, Okay. moved to Pennsylvania for high school, and then stayed there for um, college at Penn State, went to Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. Nice. PA. And then moved back to San Diego as soon as I could because 
a little bit nicer weather here. <laughs> well, and San Diego is beautiful. <laughs> yes, especially after being in the Pittsburgh area. <laughs> I'm right? sure you were like, get me out. Um, so, okay. Awesome. So did you always know, so you guys, Katie's in dermatology. Did you always know you just said, I thought I wanted to be pediatrics. So yeah. Yeah. I was ready to do pediatrics. I got to my pediatrics rotation in PA school and was like, Nope. <laughs> so you, I just knew I didn't, ah, but I'll tell you what, Michelle, for the first, I graduated in 2010. So the first five years of my career was in the emergency department. Okay. So I have acute medicine background and, um, I, from I'm in PA school, in my rotations, that's when I figured out I want to do emergency medicine. So what did you not like about pediatrics on your rotation? To be completely honest, treating the parents more than treating the patient. Yeah. I mean, I think that's how I could see it. Like just from having my own kid, uh-huh. you know, I'm, I'm like, un- <laughs> because I'm a medical professional, I think I'm like the worst parent because like, I don't bring her. <laughs> Unless it's like, this is okay. not like I, now I can't figure it out. Like I've literally reached my maximum of what I can treat my own kid. Like I don't treat her. I don't prescribe her medicines, but like, I do not take her unless it's like absolutely necessary. And I was so embarrassed the one time that I brought her and she had like a double ear infection and my husband's an ENT. And how embarrassing is that? Like we own an otoscope. Anyway, I just thought to myself, like a lot of times you're treating, like the parents are so involved and that's gotta be really hard you know, Mm -hmm. for, for certain people. And I know also for me, I went on my, and I did a blog post about this. Like I went on my oncology rotation at PA school, came back and told everybody else not to. (laughs) I was like, don't do it. It's like, this is, this is awful. (laughs) So depressing. Like you're not going to do it. And then here, like 15 years later, you know, I'm still in oncology. So you just, you know, you never know. Um, But at the same time, like you always can have an identification with one specialty or another. Like, I mean, I'm sure you were in your PA school. You're like, okay, this emergency med thing is pretty cool. I think this is what I want to do. Absolutely. I fell in love with it. And I did my my elective rotation at the same emergency room. I mean, it was just, I loved the adrenaline. I loved not knowing what was coming in next. Yeah. I didn't even mind the night shifts at that point. I was yeah stupid at that point. So So how did you get to dermatology? Okay. So I'm technically not dermatology. I don't know very much Like plastics? So I consider myself aesthetics. Okay. All right. I like that. So I, I guess it ended in, after five years in the emergency department, Mm -hmm. I had had my first baby. Yeah. I was Sleepless anyway, and <laughs> on night shifts exclusively for the last two years. And yeah. it just got to the point where just personally, it was hard for me. Yeah. I think I still enjoyed the medicine and I enjoyed my colleagues and I enjoyed the environment, but it was just the personal toll yeah. that it took on my body and, and just my family. So, you know I what? That's start- actually an important point because there was a survey from AAPA, like two years ago that asked if PAs were burned out and similar to physicians, ER PAs had the highest amount of burnout, but were also the most satisfied with their job. Like they loved their job, but couldn't like felt a little burned out from that for one reason or another. And I can also speak to like, after having a kid, your, you know, your whole life is flipped upside down, like scheduling, (laughs) Yes. everything is different based on what your husband does and all of that. So I can, I totally get that hundred percent. And between seeing the acute appendicitis and the asthma attack, I was running and pumping too. So yeah. It was one thing on top of another. And I was like, okay, I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> so then I started looking for another specialty because I knew ER just wasn't long-term for me. So yeah. I found, and I was lucky enough to be mentored by a facial plastic surgeon. Nice. So he was, he's very much into injectables. He's okay. great at those things. He does facial plastics and that's the only surgery he does. So I was very lucky to be mentored in that environment. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Um, and then in a few years ago, one of actually one of the doctors from the emergency department, 
she had started her own aesthetic practice okay and had reached out to me and said hey if you ever think about changing or doing something else yeah we have, to have you so um that's when she and I decided to become business partners and then I could run my own practice while she was running hers kind of but the beauty of that is yeah we were learning the business together right right yes, so, yes. yeah so it was great to, and we still are bounce things off of each other all of the time Medicine so and this business. is a nurse, nurse practitioner. practitioner no she's a md oh an md so you have yep. an md mm-hmm. and so facial plastics is this like an ENT trained facial plastic? So, so, or is this a plastic surgeon? So for people listening, there are different ways for physicians to be plastic surgeons. Um, my husband's an ENT and I know that he can specialize in facial plastics, although he doesn't. Um, but then you can also just be a plastic surgeon. So. Right. So yeah. he, so I don't work with him anymore. This is okay. actually, she is actually an emergent, a board certified emergency medicine. Ah, doctor. Okay who now is specializing in aesthetic medicine. Okay, interesting. So so they call them the core physicians in aesthetics who are the facial plastics, the dermatologists, and the Mm -hmm. general plastics. Yeah. Um, And then the non-core, and you'll see it these days with emergency medicine physicians, family medicine physicians, OBGYN are practicing aesthetics. So I I think we have a great, um, a great thing on our side is that being emergency medicine trained, Mm -hmm. we practice very safely. We do everything for thinking of adverse risks in the background. So I think that gives us a a leg up in the aesthetic. Yeah. So before we talk about the business side, what are your most common procedures? Yeah. So Botox for sure. So, okay. so like medically or just aesthetic Botox too? So I perform some medical Botox. Okay. However, if patients come, I don't do migraines um, okay. because typically you might be able to get that covered with your insurance. Yeah. Being aesthetics, I don't take, I don't deal with any aesthetic, any insurance. Okay. So if I can get them a discount on that, I will send them to either the neurologist or the family practice medicine doctor who can perform those treatments with insurance in mind. Okay. Um, so most of mine is cosmetic. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. So do you do like fillers and like all that too? Yeah. So Botox fillers, we okay. do uh, Kybella, which is that yeah. non-invasive or uh, non-surgical fat reduction of the double chin. We okay. do medical grade skincare treatments like microneedling and deep yeah. peels. Okay. And- cleaning and then we also do um we started doing pdo threads which are like a non-surgical lift or skin type oh wow okay -hmm. that's pretty cool um yeah so like as a pa we don't really get trained to do that kind of thing in pa school so you had said earlier that somebody had really taken you under their wing to kind of train you to do that what did that look like how long did that take that's a great question so I think for those procedures, filler is the one out of all of those filler can have the biggest risk of adverse events. Okay. So that was the one that's going to take a little bit longer to learn. You're not really going to feel comfortable, just like anything in medicine. You're not going to really feel comfortable with these procedures for maybe six to 12 months, like doing them consistently. Yeah. Botox is a little bit easier to learn. I mean, as long as you understand facial anatomy, I mean, that's always bottom line. If you sure. understand facial anatomy, you're going to be fine. Okay. Um, and so I trained about a year pretty extensively. Mm-hmm. And then, I mean, and I'm still going to, yeah. to um, continuing medical education conferences and yeah always learning because there's always so many new things coming on the market too. So you really, yeah. So let's talk filler for a second. I've never had filler, full disclosure. <laughs> I have had Botox, um, but <laughs> I have because, you know, I'm 42. So I kind of made this thing to myself that I wasn't going to try it until I was 40. So I, I turned 41 and I'm like, all right, like I got to see what the big deal's about. I have a dermatologist who's like the 
number one injector in the state who lives down the street. <laughs> and so finally I'm like, I'm going to make an appointment and go to this, you know, she's wonderful. So I go there and I'm like, okay. And I, my skin is very challenging. I have hormonal acne and I'm allergic to a lot of different things. I thought for sure I was going to be like <laughs> this like raccoon the next morning with like big red eyes or like bruises everywhere. Cause I, I mean, I literally bruise if someone touches me, it's like, okay. So, <laughs> my, <laughs> so I was like, I didn't even tell my husband nothing. I just went. So I was like, all right, I'm just gonna go. And I literally woke up the next day and I'm like, I am addicted. Like for like, I mean, I know it's supposed to take like two weeks to settle in. I noticed a difference in 24 hours. Like my first time, I just looked more awake. Like I didn't like, I was like, oh my God. Like, and I didn't have that many wrinkles. It wasn't like, oh my God, I have so many wrinkles I need. So I got like a couple here, like a couple here. And I was like, oh, I'm not bruised. I'm not itchy. I look awake. I'm like, this is so amazing. <laughs> and I was so impressed. I went to my neighbor next door who gets injections for migraines. I'm like, can you see my face? Do you see my face? She's like, what? I'm like, do you see my face? And she's like, you look the same. I'm like, no, I'm going to show you the before and after. So then, you know, you go like two weeks later and get your before and after and you're like, oh my God, this is insane. So it doesn't have to be that plasticky type look that I feel like everybody fears will happen, right? Absolutely. Yes. Thank you for making that point because a lot of people are so very scared when they sit down in my yes. chair. And, and my thing is, especially with the neuromodulators, which are Botox, Discord, Xeom, yeah. and Juba, there's four on the market right now. They are essentially just relaxing muscle. Okay. They're not changing your fundamental look. Right. They can in things like opening your eyes a little bit or yeah. lifting your brow a little bit but they don't, they're not going to give you that plastic look or that botched look that a lot of people are scared about. Yeah. Too much filler or ill-placed filler Will. Or, a bad fa or a bad facelift is what's going to make you look like <laughs> what you don't want to look like. <laughs> right. Exactly. So yeah. with filler, what are the, some of the side effects you can get from that? So we're talking like worst case scenario. Yeah. All right. So worst case scenario with filler is if it gets into an artery. Ooh. So yeah, so we're talking tissue necrosis. Okay. We're talking possible unilateral blindness. Oh my god. I mean, so there. I mean, there are risks with filler. Now, yeah. Do I treat and train other injectors in the most safe ways of doing it? Of course. Yeah. But I always talk to my patients about worst case scenario. These are things to look out for. Yeah. If you ever see any of these things, but yeah, that's worst case scenario with filler. Botox, there's really not worst case. There's not yeah. really a, maybe like what, a, where do most people get filler? Like where on their face? Oh wow, you can get a lot of places actually. So most commonly lips. That's probably okay. my most requested area. Um, cheeks. Okay. You get it in your nasal labial folds, your marionette lines. Yeah. You get it when you know smokers lines. You yeah. Get it tear troughs for that sunken look. You can get it in your chin, your jaw. Wow. Okay. You can actually get filler in your hands. Stop. Yes. Wow. <laughs> so, I mean, and there's other places. I don't personally inject in places like a nose okay. or forehead just because those are higher risk areas. Yeah. I, I personally choose not to, but you can definitely get filler anywhere. And just imagine it's filling, it's restoring volume yeah. or augmenting. So, yeah. And, and how long does something like that last? Like I know Botox is anywhere like 12 weeks, you know, nine to 12 weeks, something like that. But like a filler, how long does that last? So it depends on the filler, depends yeah. on where it's placed, depends okay. on your metabolism, depends on a lot of things. But typically I tell people in lips, you're talking maybe about six to 12 months. Okay. But imagine you're not going to wake up at, tw at six months and everything's gone. It's just right. slowly reabsorb and you're going to start to notice that your lips aren't as quite as full as they were before. Okay. Yeah. Good to know for my future. <laughs> um, I know we got on a little tangent, but I'm like, this is very informative. Um, so, all right. So let, let's tell everybody how as a PA, you can sort of own a practice, right? 
I mean, you have a medical director. So give us the nitty gritty because everybody's like, PAs can't own their own practice, hands down, no. And I know you're in California. So everybody listening, like this is kind of state to state. Laws are a little bit different. So tell us how that went about. Absolutely. So in California, to be a medical practice, a medical doctor or a DO has to own at least 51% of the practice. Okay. So, and then another allied health professional can own the other 49%. Okay. So that's how we have structured it. So okay. she owns 51%, I own 49 but then with a good lawyer, yeah. we had a draft set up that says, essentially, I run the business. She doesn't really play a part in any of the financials or any part in the running of day-to-day stuff. Okay. So that's how we have it set up. So what is her role? That is a great question. So I am incredibly lucky to have such an involved medical director. Okay. She's also in aesthetics. And anybody listening who's thinking about running your own practice, I would highly encourage you to have someone who knows the specialty you are. Yes. You are practicing because she is essentially on call for me 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If there's an emergency. Okay. If she has to leave for some reason on a vacation or a trip, she puts her assistant medical director or someone else in charge of her emergency call. So I always have backup in that sense. That's amazing. Um, So that's one of her roles. Another one is in California, um, our supervising physician has to sign. I believe it's about 10% of our chart. Okay. She signs all of our charts just because we're on an electronic medical record together yeah. for her so she can see what's going on. Okay. And then she also comes to visit our sites every so often. I believe it's like once a quarter, once a, every six weeks or something like that. So, okay. Yeah. So I know from setting up just my own business at home <laughs> that <laughs> there's a lot, I mean, I am, I was not trained in business. Like I was trained as a medical provider and a science person, and I have made some mistakes. I've done some things right. I'm still learning. I have, you know, a lot to learn, but I don't, I don't know what your experience has been like, but the learning curve is like almost intense. Like you're just like, oh my God, what is happening? You I just, I think being treat, being trained as a medical provider, you're thinking like, okay, I'm going to be like treating patients and like, I'll just be in a system. It'll be fine. And then right. when you start something like this, you're like, holy yes. <laughs> mother of God, <laughs> <laughs> like, can I get a business manager, <laughs> but you ain't got any money. So you're like, okay, well maybe I should. So how did you sort of walk through that process? And I'll tell people a little how I did it, but I think I think it would be cooler to know from you having like a practice where you treat patients, not something you do from home. That would be very interesting. There are, there were a lot of growing pains. I'll just say that. Yeah. Like I said before though, I have to say with my medical director going through the same process with her business was so helpful because yeah. we kind of did it together and learned everything together. Yeah. That being said, I mean, working in an ER for five years, you just show up and know that the, everything will be stocked and you have the syringes you need. (laughs) (laughs) So now, I mean, you go, you're right. You go from this role of just thinking you're seeing patients and doing your thing in medicine yes, to thinking about inventory and thinking Mm -hmm. about waste management and, you know, all of those things and rent and utilities and it is, it is mind boggling and it's not for the faint of heart. However, I have enjoyed, I have to say I've enjoyed every second of it. So when you, you're basically on site running the practice, doing injections and also training other people, how many people work for you? So right now, currently I have one um, assistant. She, well, no, actually we have two admin people now. Okay. My assistant is completely mobile and she takes the calls, the emails, the DMs, all of that stuff and schedules for me. Okay. And then we hired another admin who's going to help her with that role. And she's going to do more of the, and she's move into more inventory and kind of helping day to day running things. Yeah. Um, and then currently I have one more injector. She's another PA. Okay. And we are bringing on an RN 
too. That's awesome. And also an esthetician who does our medical grade peels. So, That's great. So yeah. how long have you owned this practice? Since essentially since May of 2018. Wow. Okay. So it's really recent yes. and learning something. So what has been the hardest part as a PA, you know, sort of transitioning from working for someone mm -hmm. to working for yourself? That is a really amazing question because I think there's two things that I would say to that. First yeah. is the hard thing. One hard thing is no one's there to, you have to deal with all the problems. Yes. Right? Yeah. So not only am I dealing with the shipment of Botox that needs to be refrigerated, but nobody's there to pick it up. So now I'm going to have to go grab it from <laughs> UPS. But I'm also dealing with those difficult patients yes. who, you know, so that's one. Because side I'm sure you get people that maybe aren't happy with their results or something, right? right? So. Right. So now you're managing that on top of administrative stuff. Exactly. Yeah. So I think that's one part that's really hard. I think the other part, and let's be honest, starting a business is expensive. Oh, yes. And you don't make any money at the beginning. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. going from a full-time PA salary to this, it was a big adjustment for myself and my family. But thank goodness I have a very supportive husband who has supported yeah us through all of this and has been completely my rock during everything. Yeah. But I would say those two are the biggest, the hardest things. And now that you're sort so do you feel though for your family in the long run, this is a better sort of work life balance for you? Uh, yes and no. Okay. Yes, because I make my own schedule now. Yeah. So if I need the morning off to go to my daughter's kindergarten class, well, yeah. not right now, but. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. We're all home right now. I know. We're all here. <laughs> <laughs> but that is nice for work-life balance. Yeah. On the flip side, I'm working a lot at home because I can't put things away. So even at home, yeah. I'm working on social media or, you mm -hmm. know, talking to my admin people. So I think yes and no. Yeah. I feel the same way actually. So, you know, I, I kind of fell into doing this a little bit, um, from my own standpoint, I, you know, had a couple people reach out to me about getting help on the PA process. I had some people locally and, you know, kind of doing stuff, you know, free, like just helping people. And then I decided to LLC last year and, I didn't know anything about being an LLC. I didn't know what that actually meant. I didn't know I had to write, I had to like, um, you know, list with the state. I didn't know that I had to be like a registered business and have like a business address. And there's a lot of things that took me like a really long time <laughs> to get a hold of. Um, and, and the financial piece for me was hard too, because I had never, you know, had a business account or needed a business account or did any of that. Yeah. And, and, you know, being just me, I didn't have a ton of expenses, but I did have to, you know, pay for a lot of things that is just like your setup, like legal yes. fees mm -hmm. and, you know, like LLCing is not cheap and, you yeah. know, getting a lawyer and a bank yeah. account and, you know, all that stuff, it costs money. So I think that's one thing that, I struggled with, and I still like am working on, you know, from that, but I agree with you a hundred percent. I love owning my own business, but it is hard to turn it off. Yes. And yeah. people are like, oh, but that's so amazing. You do it from home. I do do it from home, but I also need some childcare because yeah. I got her walking in because she's home now when she was in school is a little bit easier when she's home, you know, it's harder for me to turn it off because I'm trying to get in pockets of time, you know, for, for me to do things. And while I really enjoy it and now have some administrative people helping me and all of those things, you need the time. So like when they go to sleep, you know, you do a podcast or you do this or you do that. So there's so many wonderful things about it, but I do think that like balancing it has become an art form for yes. me. Yes. Like I'm still like, there are two days a week I'm off. Like for uh, you. I had to, because Dave, Dave was like, Michelle, like 
you're, you're constantly, I don't know. And, and, you know, he's right. I mean, I'm constantly working. And so I shut it down on Fridays and I shut down on Sundays and I'm like, you know what? I have one day with her. I have one day with the family. Like I need to shut it down because it's really hard to do that when you're, and even for students out there that are now online studying at home, you got to learn to set boundaries for yourself or you're going to be like cuckoo town. But that's been the hardest time, the hardest thing for me as like, a, you know, just having my own personal brand business. I can't imagine for you, you know, running a practice with patients, having those complaints, having those, but it's all customer service too. You know, I mean, yeah. And especially in aesthetics, it's yeah. very heavy on customer service, but I agree with you hundred percent about the boundaries thing. Yeah. Because I try to not answer texts unless they're emergent. I mean, I'm always looking at them just in case yeah. there's something I need to get to, but for scheduling and whatnot from nine to five yeah. every Friday, because if yeah. I would be answering at 10 o'clock at night and oh, easy. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. and then trying to grow your brand on social media too. So now are you, what kind of corporation are you? Are you, uh, we are an S corp. An S corp. Okay. Yeah. I have no idea what that means. I don't really either, but that's what <laughs> my lawyer told me I had to be in California to be a medical corporation. <laughs> so, okay. So that's a good point too. Like, so when you looked at the laws in California for PAs, it was specific. Like that's what it said. It said well, you can okay. own 49% of a practice. Yes. That was specific. Okay. But my attorney, and I love him for it, is very conservative, just like I am, and okay. just like my talk is. So he said, it's kind of gray in California, but if you're using your license in any sort of way, it should be a S corp. Yes. So I, 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 <laughs> yeah. So like for me, I'm not practicing medicine. Right. So- for me to be a, you know, LLC is fine because it's just me. I'm not using my license to give right. medical advice or do procedures. But if you're going to be doing that, I could see there are different levels of corporations for people listening. So I could see why you would have to scale that up, you know, yeah. to be practicing medicine and doing that. And, if you, um, and my advice, if you're thinking about opening a practice, get a great lawyer and yeah. get a great CPA. <laughs> Those two things yes. will pay dividends later. Yes. I have an amazing bookkeeper. Jor where, if Jordan, if you're listening, I love her. I mean, <laughs> I can't do that. Like, I cannot do that. I was like, I, I, here's where I'm going to spend my money. Like, mm -hmm. Um, you know, I just, I don't have the capability for that. So I think you're so right. A good lawyer, <laughs> a good accountant, a good partner. Yes, for sure. So talk sure. about your relationship with your doctor, because even in regular practice as a PA, having a great relationship with your doctor is super important. I feel like anyway. I am so lucky and I tell her very often how lucky I feel to have her because yeah. she, like we talked about, she is, she is in aesthetics. So if I have a problem or a question or I'm just feeling unsure about a patient, she's there and she's been through it. Yeah. We go to conferences together. We, I mean, our kids know each other. I mean, yeah. we're friends too. Yeah. So we have a absolutely great relationship and she's just the kindest person and she is so incredibly smart. So I'm so lucky to yeah. have a partner like her. I think that's really important. Your partner, like your true partners, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, and I feel like that, you know, with my doctors too, and I've been very lucky to have doctors that have always made me feel like a partner. They mm -hmm. never make me absolutely. feel less than um, they don't get me wrong. I mean, they'll call me out, <laughs> especially <laughs> one of them's like, what do you know? Like you miss this, like what? Um, but I love that, you know, I love that that's continuous learning. Um, but I do think having that super, you know, we're all friends outside of work. Um, but when we're at work, we're partners and you know, what we say to each other is not personal. Um, and you know, very lucky to have people you can trust. I think is a super important message for, I, you know, I have, I've encountered some PAs who are uncomfortable with their physicians and stuff like that. And, you know, for me personally, I just think that's a relationship that has to 
work a hundred percent as a PA. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I have to say that in this realm where we are in practice and in this sort of business sense, it's, I guess, easier to have that relationship. In the ER, I had some attendings that I would dread every shift that I would have to work with them for one reason or another. I mean, it ranged from, we just had a different style of care for patients. Right. They were over orders and I was, you know, so I think when you are a true partner, it makes the biggest difference in the world. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if you had to kind of go back and sort of give advice to anybody that was thinking about opening your their own practice or have been told PAs can't co-own a practice, what would you kind of say to them? You absolutely can. Mm-hmm. And if that's your dream, go for it. It's a lot of hard work, but go for it. It's so rewarding. And it's so, at the end of the day, I'm doing what I love. And I mean, I really feel like that's the most important thing in life. That's great. So like when you um, sort of, well, you still have to recertify as a PA, right? Yep. Like every 10 years and stuff. So do you feel like some people ask me like, is that hard to do if you're in kind of a specialty practice? Um, I have not seen that for me it's hard because you're not doing all those other things, but you just kind of study and do the test. Do you think being in aesthetics would make that harder for you? So I have to say that I recertified, I was, I had the five years of emergency background. So, but you know what? (laughs) Nothing in any sort of practice is textbook. I mean, we can all agree on that. So you're studying it all again anyway. So I don't think it's going to make a huge difference, honestly, because even being in emergency medicine, nothing comes in like the textbook says it does. So I was relearning it textbook edition anyway. Yeah, I completely agree. And I have some people that reach out to me that are like, I really want to be a dermatology or I really want to be like, you know, in aesthetics or do that. And, you know, that's not necessarily what we're trained to do in as PAs in a PA program. No, but you still have to have all of that other background, you know, Absolutely. for the complications that may happen. Mm-hmm. I mean, would you agree? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I would say on a good week, I have one to two people have a sync, um, a pre syncable episode in my chair. Yeah. Needles. And I'll tell you what, if I hadn't done that five years of emergency care, yeah. freak out every time. <laughs> and just from the like, needles, oh. they're like, no. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. That's all that could happen. <laughs> like, I'm feeling a little sweaty right now. Yes. <laughs> like, head down, feet up, let's go. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The thing for me about Botox that's different. So when I get like blood drawn, oh, no. <laughs> I cannot <laughs> handle this situation, but like for some reason, cause it's like on my face and I can't see it. I'm like, I'm okay. I'm good. <laughs> totally fine. Um, but <laughs> no, I was like, but it's like, oh my God, you know, it's, I mean, it's crazy, but I think, you know, anytime you're manipulating anybody's face or doing any injections or wherever it is, you have a risk for complications. You have to be trained medically for that. So, I mean, you have the training, Um, And there obviously is additional training you need to do. So like for your licensure, I know in some states that they require for your scope of practice, if you're like at a facility or something, you have to do so many procedures before you can be like checked off. Do you have to do that? So in California, it's pretty gray. So I did go through those yeah. checkoffs when I was training under the facial plastic surgeon. So I okay. had a lot of that. For in a business sense, for malpractice in my own practice, I needed a certificate to okay. say I went to a training. Yes. I essentially know something about facial anatomy that gets me yeah. through. So, um, but semantics at that point. I knew what I was doing. I just needed the piece of paper, but yeah. 
Yeah. And you brought up a very good, a very good point right there with the malpractice. So me working at a university or whatever, I am kind of covered under the university's malpractice for mm-hmm. the physicians. But, and when I worked in a community oncology practice, it was the same way. I was sort of kind of covered in with the physician's plan, but for you owning your own business, you have to have your own, right? Correct. Yes. So I carry malpractice okay. um, and it covers obviously all of my injectors, covers my medical director in a medical director. Okay. So she, yeah. So she's not an actual injector on the policy. Okay. But everybody else is under the policy. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's very important. I think for people, are there PA specific like malpractice policies or is this just a general sort of medical malpractice? Yeah, medical malpractice. Medical malpractice. We actually found a company who specializes in med spas. Okay. They feel a little more comfortable that they knew the realm and they knew that. So that's who we went through. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Okay, because I get asked that too. Like, do you have your own malpractice? I'm like, well, no, because I'm sort of in a university setting. So it's a little bit different. But even when I was in a private practice setting, I kind of fell under the umbrella of the physician's they put me on their malpractice policy. So it sounds similar in that, you know, in that regard. So, um, if, so when you were going to PA school, did you ever think you would be in this spot? Absolutely. Hands down. No. (laughs) (laughs) Did you even know it was a possibility? Absolutely. Hands down. No. (laughs) Okay. No, I, I didn't know this was even in the realm of possibilities. And like I told, I fell in love with emergency medicine. I was, yeah. thought that was going to be the rest of my life. And now I'm on the opposite spectrum. So I recently like kind of did a short video about how I, I kind of get pet peeved about the term lateral mobility mm. because I, first of all, I understand that it means, you know, we can all change specialties and whatnot, but it it peeves me a little bit. It kind of gets under my skin because it takes away from our potential upward mobility and as PAs. And so that's really the reason why I'm like, if I see that in a personal statement, it's gone in 10 seconds or less. Um, I, we can talk about changing specialties every day of the week. Um, but I feel that oftentimes what we don't talk about with this profession is the opportunity that's outside of clinical medicine. And absolutely. I just, so when I see that, I get a little bit annoyed, (laughs) but it's not, it's not anything to do with the person writing it. I know exactly what they're saying. Um, But I also want to make sure that I'm educating people that, you know, there are a lot of things you can do as a PA that maybe you never even thought about like co-owning a practice, Mm -hmm. like starting your own business, like being the president of a board of something, you know, like being, you know, being in administration, being in clinical research, something like that. So, you know, I think it's really important for us to sort of shed light on that. Don't you agree? I mean, I agree 100%. And thank you for having this platform to do that because you're right. I think in PA school, it's just kind of thought that you're going to enter a practice or a hospital system and that's that. And that's what you do. Yeah. And I would say 99% of my classmates, that's what they're doing. And great if that works for you. But there are so many other opportunities out there. I mean, I've, I've now in, well, it got pushed back. It was going to be in July, but it's going to be in November now, the aesthetic show. So it's the yeah. biggest show in Vegas for aesthetics. Yeah. I'm going to be speaking at it. So, I mean, it's that's amazing. so much cool stuff out there yeah. and it just, it warms my heart to see other PAs on the faculty at, yeah. at shows. Yes. So. And like on boards and yes. advocating at the white house and doing all of these amazing things. Um, I didn't know that was a possibility when I was a new grad. I think that, um, we're all sort of, you know, we've kind of evolved (laughs) over time for me. I think we all have to kind of do our time in clinical practice. I I do, Uh but I also think that at some point you're going to say, maybe I want to do something else. And 
maybe that's 10 years in, maybe it's five, maybe it's 20, but know that there are opportunities that you can create for yourself or you can find within the PA profession that you'd be surprised about. I agree. I agree 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So any advice to a pre-PA applying right now? It's, it's application time. Any advice? Oh my gosh, you're taking me back, Michelle. <laughs> taking it back. Taking it back. <laughs> <laughs> if I were, I mean, it seems super cliche. So let me just start with that. But keep a positive mindset. Just imagine yourself, if this is truly what you want to do, imagine what it would feel like, taste like, smell like be to be in PA school to be working as a PA I mean I think that will just encompass what you're feeling what you're thinking and the universe has its way of putting oh my god all right so you just you we are like kindred because I told two people today if you put that negative crap out into the universe that is exactly what's going to happen if you start saying, oh, I don't think I'm competitive enough. Oh, I don't think I can do this. Oh, I'm like, stop it exactly right now. And every freaking morning you wake up and you say, I am going to do this. Like, I am going to get an interview this cycle. I will be a P Like, I know it's corny. I know it's cheese ball, but it's about Ask vision. Oh, it's about uh, the vision. I, oh my goodness. Yes. It's, it's about totally, even say I am a PA, even if you're pre -PA, yes. even if you're working on your prerequisites, say it, mean it, feel it. It is yes. going to happen. Yes. I, yeah. Imagine yourself at that interview. Like vision is so important. Um, I never like in, in forever would have envisioned myself being here. But last year I was like, when I'm here this year, doing this with pre-PAs, this is what this is going to look like for me. And it happens like you, but you work for it. Don't get me wrong. Like you have to work for it. But if you put the work in and you do the thing and you, and you are, give yourself some confidence and give yourself the vision, you can co-own your own practice. You can own your own business. You can have a side hustle. You can do whatever you want. I mean, <laughs> the opportunities are endless. So we could do a, probably a whole podcast on mindset and positive yes. energy. And, yes. But yes, I am totally on board with it. I would not be where I am today without reframing negative thoughts to positive ones. Yes. And mindset that has changed my entire life, my entire yes. trajectory of my career even my family life. So I am a believer. Sure. I, I'm completely with you. And Katie, I am so, I, I'm so impressed by you. I love that you have done this with your career as a PA. And I'm, I'm so, so thankful that you're here today to kind of shed light on that for everybody. You're an inspiration um, to so many people. And thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. This has been a wonderful experience. All right, you guys. So go follow Katie on Instagram. Your handle is, tell them what your handle is. It's Katie. Katie underscore the underscore aesthetics underscore PA. <laughs> <laughs> so just remember that. No, it'll be in the notes from this podcast. So just look below and you'll find her. So if you have questions or if you're in the California area um, and want to talk to her, you can find her there. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you, Michelle.